I'd like to welcome Vice Chancellor Professor Ian Young, Professor Karen Chalmers, who's hiding at the back there, Professor Jane Godfrey, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Neil Farger. I'm Deputy Dean of Research at the ANU College of Business and Economics. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture on managing the world's most precious resource, Australia's leadership in creating a new discipline. Uh, before we commence tonight's proceedings, a few words of acknowledgement. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history. I would now like to invite Vice-Chancellor Professor Ian Young to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening by sharing a few words about the significance of water accounting and the recent publication of a new book by Professor Jane Godfrey and Professor Karen Chalmers. Well, thank you, and uh, Neil, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and uh, welcome here to the ANU. Uh, I'd like to extend a very special welcome uh, to Professor Kieran Chalmers, Head of the Department of Accounting and Finance at Monash University. Together with tonight's speaker, Professor Chalmers is co-editor of the book we're really launching tonight, uh, Water Accounting, International Approaches to Policy and Decision Making. It is my pleasure to introduce this evening's talk uh, by Professor Jane Godfrey, uh, Dean of the ANU College of Business and Economics. As a leader in the development of a system of general purpose water accounting, Professor Godfrey um, will discuss growth of this new discipline of water accounting and its significance to public policy, to water management, and indeed to world peace. A few words first about the significance and importance of uh, indeed this discipline of water accounting. A shared resource uh, very much demands a shared commitment and it was this realisation which resulted in the establishment of Australia's National Water Initiative in 2004. As we all learn this evening, this national plan created a need for high quality information about water and provided the catalyst for Australia's world leading efforts in developing a system known as general purpose water accounting. Now, of course, water accounting is not a new concept, but until recently, approaches had predominantly been statistically based and focused on the economic value of water or used specifically to inform natural resource management. In developing water accounting standards uh, based on providing reports to stakeholders in a manner analogous to financial accounting, Australia is breaking new ground and taking a lead globally. There's little, there's little doubt that general purpose water accounting will improve public knowledge and understanding of water resources within Australia and make an important contribution to the sustainability of our water supplies. And of course, for a country like Australia, these are indeed precious. However, this pioneering work is also generating a significant amount of international interest with the further adoption of systems outside Australia looking likely. Professor Godfrey's leadership in the area of accounting theory and her experience on the Australian Accounting Standards Board led to her appointment subsequently on Australia's Water Accounting Standards Board. This board is responsible for developing the world's first water accounting standard, which was launched, as I understand, just last night. If the benefits of common water accounting standards are clear at the national level, do they then translate internationally? Well, supported by an Australian Research Council grant, Professor Godfrey and her colleagues have been addressing this very question. One outcome of this work is indeed the new book co-edited by Professors Godfrey and Chalmers, Water Accounting, International Approaches to Policy and Decision Making. And this brings together multiple, multiple perspectives on water accounting. It investigates how different approaches have developed in different countries in response to their specific challenges and emphasises the important role that water accounting can play in addressing critical issues at the regulatory, legal and political levels, not just in informing a water management system but in broader issues. It draws together the work of policy and practice experts from around the globe uh, and of academics across disciplines ranging from hydrology and hydrography to law and financial reporting. In addition to her 
university responsibilities, Professor Godfrey maintains a high level of business and community in engagement. For her service to Australian society through business leadership, she was awarded Australia's Centenary Medal and she is a past Telstra Businesswoman of the Year. She also received the 2008 Accounting and Finance Association of Australia and New Zealand Outstanding Contribution to Accounting and Financial Practice Award. Recently, she has become a passionate advocate of water accounting at national and international levels for reasons which I'm sure we'll hear later this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in welcoming Professor Jane Godfrey. Well, thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. I'm absolutely delighted to be here this evening to, uh, to talk to you about a topic that started for me as a mild curiosity, then became an intellectual interest, and now, as the Vice-Chancellor has mentioned, is actually a genuine passion. Now, as we all know, regulation is invariably invoked or introduced to deal with some sort of market failure. Tonight I'm going to talk about regulation, research and reporting that attempt a partial solution to water market failures and their related consequences. And as has already been mentioned, this is a particularly timely presentation given that last night Australia's and indeed as far as we know the world's first water accounting standard was launched. But first what I'd like to do is talk to you today about uh, market failures, both domestic and internationally. Then I'd like to talk about the Australian journey that took a group of financial accounting researchers into the world of water politics. And uh, I think we've emerged relatively unscathed, but of course uh, we're still early in that, uh, in that piece. I'm going to be talking about how the combination of financial accounting with engineering, hydrology, hydrography, law, almost you name it, every discipline seems to have been involved with this because water touches every aspect of our lives and in some way most disciplines. I'm also going to talk about how academia has worked incredibly well with practice and policymakers to come up with what is in fact a new system of reporting. What I'll then talk about is the research that, uh, that Karen and I and our colleagues are undertaking in relation to ARC grants, Australian Research Council funded research that is, into the potential impact of water accounting at international and national levels. And in particular I'm going to talk about three projects within the one project that we've been funded to undertake. The first part of that is in fact the book, which you can see here, um, that, uh, that has been published only recently. Uh, it's called Water Accounting, International Approaches to Policy and Decision Making for fairly obvious reasons if you have the chance to read through it. We'll also talk about some experiments that are currently being undertaken by researchers and PhD students that investigate the impact of water accounting, standardised water accounting, at that on decision making by investors, by auditors and by credit analysts. So moving the water accounting into the financial impact, the impact on our daily lives in terms of investments and in terms of uh, credit analysis and infrastructure decisions. And then I'll move to the next area which is, uh, which is still under progress and that is development of an institutional framework for setting international water accounting standards, given that, uh, that we are already well on the way. In fact, we are extremely well on the way. We've passed the major hurdle of a first water accounting standard in, uh, in domestic terms. Is there a scope internationally? And if so, how should it work? Along the way, I'm also going to mention uh, the impact of the Australian water accounting standard system as it's been adopted in two countries uh, quite far from here. Uh, South Africa and Spain, where we've been able to convince parties to actually trial the system, and they've found that it, uh, that it does actually work, uh, much to their dismay when they find out some of the information that it does report. 
I'll also talk about the interest from China very briefly and the US and more globally. And finally, I will acknowledge that Australia's system of water accounting will probably not broker world peace. However, it will hopefully demonstrate, or I'll hopefully demonstrate, that it can go part of the way towards conflict mitigation and towards dispute resolution in ways that will assist in that task. But first, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, the first is that the opinions I express tonight are mine and, uh, and do not necessarily reflect those of any organisation uh, with which I'm associated, and that includes the Water Accounting Standards Board or the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Uh, the second disclaimer is to clarify that I am not a water expert. My expertise, uh, hopefully, resides in the areas of financial accounting and the economic consequences and determinants of, uh, of accounting. Uh, in fact, the sort of research that I mainly engage in investigates the impact of accounting on share prices, uh, stock returns, and, uh, and other economic consequences, firms financing and investment decisions. So why did I get involved with water accounting? Well, as the Vice-Chancellor mentioned, it was because of my background in accounting theory, which was deemed to be relevant to a water accounting. At, uh, at a stage when no one knew what water accounting would be, and also because I've had experience in standard setting, having served on the Australian Accounting Standards Board. But uh, to share um, a very badly kept secret, when I was phoned by the government uh, to assess my interest in being on the, on the predecessor to the Water Accounting Standards Board, I was asked a series of questions, that was fine, and at the end of those questions I was asked one further, and that was, an afterthought. Uh, an afterthought. Uh, Professor Godfrey, uh, we should have asked, uh, do you have an interest in water, by the way? To which my response, and apologies to those who've heard this before, but to which my response was, I drink it, I shower at least daily, I swim whenever I can, but I never, but never mix it with my scotch. <laughs> so let's start uh, at the beginning as I know it. And that is in relation to market failures, and I think this is a beginning that everyone will identify with. In the past decade, there has been absolutely no issue that's more important to Australia or to the world than the sourcing, protection and distribution of water. As we know, transborder flows, whether they're in Australia, so crossing the borders of, uh, of our various states and territories, or whether they are in other continents, international transborder flows that occur when, uh, when rivers flow from one country contaminated into another or uncontaminated preferably. But Australia is particularly vulnerable. We're particularly vulnerable to water scarcity. Why? Because we're the driest inhabited continent in the world. We have significant variability in rainfall, which is seasonally, yearly, and of course across the region. Uh, and we also have the highest per capita use of water. And as we're all no doubt aware, our recent drought and the policy responses to it have ensured that water management and water governance have been incredibly highly charged emotional and political issues in Australia. Some of those issues have been exacerbated by different language and different reporting systems across our states and territories. So an allocation, a water allocation in one state, is not a water allocation in another state, by definition. The states have different definitions. They do not talk to each other. The systems of reporting have meant that one state will contend that uh, there's a delivery of water of a certain volume to the other, but that won't match the records of the recipient state. So premiers have, of course, been at loggerheads in relation to these sorts of issues. And without agreement on the fundamental truth of the situation, how much water is going where, when, how and why, there's been difficulty advancing any approaches to resolving our perceived problems of water scarcity. In the meantime, of course, South Australia remained dry. 
Now, market failures in relation to uh, water management were evident in those interstate battles, and they were brought home probably at the very most micro level. Uh, and this, I think, is, uh, is, is something that, uh, that resonates for me when I read about it in the, from when I read about it in the papers. When a passerby killed a person for the simple reason that he saw him watering without using recycled water. It was that important to us. So there were life and death issues involved. But more generally, the community concerns focused upon questions such as how much water is there in the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, how much is available in the dams surrounding our major capital cities, and how much was there elsewhere. Is it sensible to establish a desalination plant? But even post-drought, water management and governance remain contentious. While much of the recent debate focuses on the Murray-Darling Basin, and that of course has been subject to news today, including research that's being undertaken by ANU researchers, it is also an issue elsewhere. In fact, there are very few areas around Australia where it's not an issue. But these issues are even more contentious internationally where transborder flows create property rights issues ranging from agriculture, uh, agricultural, environmental, health and economic sustainability to sustainability of life. International water law, as we know, is a growing specialisation for these reasons. We know that there are private diversions of river systems in Chile that cause water shortages that otherwise would not exist. We know that the great northern plains of China have enormous salinity issues because of over-extractions, and that creates issues through other parts of Australia. We know that in China there are issues with uh, trans-border flows from province to province or from mainland China to Hong Kong because of contamination. If anyone's been to South Africa in the last decade, they'll know that daily news reports contamination of water flows from mining settlements through shanty towns and other low socioeconomic areas. So these are issues. It's not just scarcity, it's also the quality of water. Yet in some countries and some parts of countries, including Australia, clear, fresh, high quality water is abundant. So there are clearly market failures nationally and internationally, and these have led to some semblance of solutions or attempts to resolve. And addressing those issues sensibly is going to require high quality information. Enter the National Water Initiative, enter water accounting. So let me talk very briefly about the National Water Initiative. As everyone would be aware, the National Water Initiative uh, was signed up to by the Commonwealth and State and Territory Governments uh, between 2004 and 2006. It is basically a blueprint or a plan for water management and governance reform throughout Australia. It's very important, but from my personal perspective in terms of the work that I've been doing, its critical importance is that it actually recognises a key uh, a key component or a key element, and it describes it as that, a key element being water resource accounting, which we've abbreviated to water accounting. And paragraph 80, as you can see, stipulates of the, this is paragraph 80 of the international agreement, or sorry, of the uh, intergovernmental agreement on a national water initiative. The parties agree that the outcome of water resource accounting is to ensure that adequate measurement, monitoring and reporting systems are in place in all jurisdictions, all jurisdictions, to support public and investor confidence in the amount of water being traded, extracted for consumptive use and recovered and managed for environmental and other public benefit outcomes. Well, I'd like to suggest that that's a very grand vision. Uh, water accounting can't achieve that, but it can contribute to enabling public assessment of whether there is that water available, whether, that those, uh, that whether there is reason for confidence. And that's where we came in. So this agreement, as you can appreciate, was the catalyst for Australia's approach to general purpose water accounting. And in 2007, 
A Water Accounting Development Committee was formed, which has now been uh, restructured to be the Water Accounting uh, Standards Board, that's my typo there, uh, prizes for picking any others, uh, from 2009. And one of the early things that we did uh, on this board, as I'll refer to it from here on, is to ask a very simple question. What in the world are we trying to do? We know we're supposed to create a system of water accounting, but what type of water accounting? Is it water accounting to inform managers so that they can manage water better? No. If we go back, water accounting as it was envis envisaged in the National Water Initiative is to inform the public. So it's an external focus. This is not about managing internally, it's about reporting externally. And that, that was the approach that we took with a view that external reporting would drive behaviours. In other words, that which is measured will be managed. That which is reported to shareholders, to other stakeholders, will be managed internally. And in fact, that's what we're seeing. So the process that we've engaged in was, has been actually a very interesting exercise and I think uh, one of great restraint and sensibility. Instead of going straight into uh, developing standards, there was an assessment sponsored. Uh, Associate Professor Brad Potter was, uh, was charged with the task of establishing user needs. What are the sorts of things that people are interested in? What do they need to assess whether water's being managed well? And not surprisingly, he came back with a range of, uh, a range of qualitative characteristics that, uh, that reporting would need to, to include, and those match very well with the financial reporting qualitative characteristics of faithful representation, of uh, timeliness, uh, relevance, and the like. And particularly, of course, comparability, because we want comparability across entities and across, uh, across states and territories. And comparability over time. So that was stage one. Without that, we couldn't really have gone to stage two, which was to develop a conceptual framework, a water accounting conceptual framework, which has subsequently underpinned every single stage of uh, standard development and hopefully will continue to do so. So uh, around about the same time that the user needs study was in, uh, was in process, uh, the board, or the committee as it was then, also commissioned uh, Karen Chalmers, myself and Brad Potter to, uh, to develop a draft conceptual framework for water accounting. And we worked through that uh, with huge benefits from flying under the radar from having a basis in accounting theory and being able to draw upon that because what was also uh, decide, established as a user need, something understandable like financial accounting. So uh, we may take, uh, take note of that. <laughs> but the conceptual framework uh, was, uh, was a, an interesting labour of, uh, of love at times and exasperation at others. But at the end of the day, we actually completed a conceptual framework which runs from establishing what are the objectives of what we call general purpose water accounting through to what are the elements, what's involved, what are the qualitative characteristics, what will be the types of statements, uh, what sorts of disclosures will be required, what sorts of levels of assurance will be required, if any. Now, those who have a financial accounting background will realise, and also measurement, I mentioned that in particular, we do also have a, uh, a statement of account, water accounting concepts in relation to measurement. And those who have grown up with financial reporting will realise that in fact what we've been doing in the water accounting world is almost the opposite of what's happened in financial accounting. Because what's happened in financial accounting is that in fact uh, Various countries have developed their own systems, standards for, water, for financial reporting. There's been an international um, collaboration, for want of a better expression, that's led to uh, the development of international financial standards, many of which have evolved from 
uh, from national standards, and they are quite often full of inconsistencies. Well, perhaps not full of inconsistencies, but they do contain inconsistencies. Why? Because they haven't evolved from that one simple statement or set of statements of principles. And now what's happening in the financial reporting world is that we're actively retrofitting accounting standards to a conceptual framework that's under development. And uh, I did mention, for example, that, uh, that in the water accounting world we've actually got a, a statement of concepts that relates to measurement. In financial reporting, I remember as, uh, as a lecturer of a third year subject once telling my students that it's taking forever to develop a conceptual framework in financial accounting because of the politics involved and, and the range of issues and that the next statement of uh, accounting concepts should be in relation to measurement, but it would probably not happen in my lifetime. That was fine. But when I actually marked an exam paper several months later to find that the student reported that the next statement of accounting concepts should be in measure on measurement, but it won't happen in Professor Godfrey's lifetime, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure whether that was a death wish or uh, <laughs> or well, someone was trying to say something about accounting. But I guess what I'm really trying to say here is that we've had some benefits of, uh, of being able to fly beneath, beneath the radar and draw upon Australian and international experience in accounting to, uh, to develop that conceptual framework. And it has, as I mentioned, underpinned everything that's evolved. And this has happened fairly quickly. If we think about it, 2009, a conceptual framework, the same year, uh, a preliminary Australian water accounting standard was released for general discussion, uh, intense discussion, intense debate, particularly with the water people who, uh, who wanted to debate accounting concepts and the accounting people who wanted to debate water uh, practice. An exposure draft came out of that in 2010, October 2010. The Bureau of Meteorology used that exposure draft as the basis for the world, for, sorry, not the world's, for Australia's first national water account, uh, and that was based on the conceptual framework, as opposed to the Australian Bureau of Statistics types of uh, national accounts. And then, as I mentioned, uh, last night, uh, the, the launching of Australia's and the world's first water accounting standard. Uh, AUS 1, Preparation and Presentation of General Purpose Water Accounting Standards or AOS 1, in short, for those of us who like to finish our sentences quickly. Not only that, but the standard has with it guidance notes, model accounts, and a basis for conclusions. Uh, also, unlike the uh, financial accounting standards that you would find if you went to the US, the Financial Accounting Standards Board standards, they're not that thick. They are, in fact, that thick. Why? Because they are principles based. They are standards of principles. These are the principles which, you, if you abide by them professionally, will guide and constrain the way that water is reported. But not just water, also rights and other entitlements to water, because they are, of course, just as important in various ways. So that's been the, the, the history. I can't under well, I can't overemphasize actually uh, the role of the conceptual framework in this development. And it is also underpinning the next Australian Water Accounting Standard, which will hopefully be, uh, be released as an exposure draft within the next six months and, uh, and become a standard relatively soon afterwards. And that's, uh, that's a standard in relation to assurance of water accounting reports, which you can probably imagine is going to be very interesting because it embraces the assurance of reports that cross from assurance of information about water flows in river systems uh, to assurance of reports about the trading of water rights. One involves wet stuff, one it does not. So we've got a very interesting area of uh, uh, of interest for both engineers and hyd hydrologists at one extreme and, uh, and accountants and auditors at the other. 
So let me talk then a little bit, just briefly in summary, about what I think has been successful for us in, uh, in developing the water accounting standards in Australia. The first thing, and I didn't mention this um, at the start, is that we cleared the path with other standard setters. Now you might say, well, why is, what, what are we talking about here? When I was first invited onto, onto the, uh, the predecessor of the board, my first question was, has anyone actually talked to the Australian Accounting Standards Board to ensure that we're not overlapping with work that they're doing? The response was, uh, no, but we'd better do it very quickly. And we did. And the main purpose of that was to clarify the boundaries of each party's role. So it's important to recognise here, in case I, I don't mention it later, that the Australian Accounting Standards Board is focused upon developing financial reporting standards for Australia. They deal with dollars. The Water Accounting Standards Board overlaps to some extent the, uh, the work, but our reporting, at least at the moment, is entirely volumetric and qualitative. So it's about volumes of water and, uh, and the quality of water rather than the actual dollar value. It's my wish that at some stage the two systems will be running in parallel and a bridge will be built to ensure that in fact the work that's happening in water accounting will translate and financial statements will at last recognise that water is an asset and has a financial value because in many parts of Australia and the world it's not reported on financial statements and that creates its own sets of perverse incentives such as to buy rights to, it, to, uh, to water rather than actually own the water so that you can report it on the balance sheet. So we've cleared the path with other standard setters. We're actually working with the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board to develop the next AOS or accounting, Australian Water Accounting Standard on assurance and that's also pretty much a world first to, uh, to actually have a jointly issued standard when it happens. The other thing is the consistently conceptual approach as I've mentioned, the theory drives the, uh, the practice and the standards. We've flown under the radar deliberately keeping uh, relatively quiet in relation to, uh, to this, this task. The cross-disciplinary nature. Uh, when I first joined, I think there was a board of, or a group of about 13 of us, uh, an irrigator, um, a policy maker, a water authority manager, hydrologist, engineers, uh, you name it, one accountant, and, uh, and those were pretty good odds. So, uh, so it worked well. Uh, we now have an even balance of water and accounting expertise. The other thing is that all along the way we've had consultation, consultation, consultation and then more consultation. Starting with focus groups to establish user needs, through to roundtable meetings, through to seminars, uh, public lectures and the like, and, uh, and certainly many, many meetings uh, in Canberra with, uh, with stakeholders in government and, uh, and the National Water Commission, for instance. We've also piloted approaches because one of the first issues we struck was, this is never going to work. Why would anyone do it? Answer, if it works, people will do it. So in fact, we've uh, been fortunate in being able to, uh, to sponsor various organisations to trial the system. And what's been interesting is that every organisation that has trialled it has come back and said, wow, this is doing so much more than we ever knew. We've learnt about our own operations. And that's where I mentioned the external reporting is actually driving internal behaviour because they've taken it up after that without funding and used it very systematically to guide their own practices. So if I can uh, move on then to, uh, to uh, a quick comment about the objective and exactly what we mean by general purpose water accounting. 
We describe it in the water accounting uh, conceptual framework as a systematic process of identifying, recognizing, quantifying, reporting and assuring information about water, rights or other entitlements or claims to water, and about obligations to deliver water. So it's not just what you have, but what you're obliged to deliver. The objective being to assist in meeting information needs of users who are otherwise unable to command that information. We're not trying to provide information to parties who can already command it. Management can decide what they need. This is to you and me as stakeholders in, let's say, the Murray-Darling Basin. Or, uh, or investors in mining companies wanting to know what is the critical issue about water that might bring this company to its knees if, in fact, it's in such an arid area that it can't survive. So as you can see, it's really not just about water. It's about water and derivative issues. Who's likely to use it? Policy formulators already are. This is the sort of information that should underpin water allocation decisions when the reporting is on a state and territory basis. Water pricing decisions. It should be of interest to water market investors, uh, to traders and brokers, and to environmental organisations. So we have the, water, the environmental manager actually on the Water Accounting Standards Board at the moment but it goes well beyond the environment into the economic domain as well. So the potential decisions that are going to be affected are in fact in relation to uh, economic, social and uh, environmental types of issues. So what do they look like? Three primary statements. I know the Vice-Chancellor has commented, analogous to financial reporting. The equivalent of the cash flow statements is a statement of water flows. The equivalent of the profit and loss, as some would call it, or statement of comprehensive income, a statement of change, changes in water assets and water liabilities. Why water assets and water liabilities and why not water? Answer, this is incorporating the notion of accruals. This is recognising that an organisation may, for example, at one point in time, have significant storages of water, but be obligated to actually deliver that water, plus more, the very next day. So it's important to build that in and recognise, if you'll pardon the pun, the solvency of that, uh, that organisation. And of course, a statement of water assets and water liabilities akin to the balance sheet. Plus contextual information and uh, notes and assurance. If anyone wants to see what uh, a statement of water flows might look like, this is one of the model accounts for a statement of water flows with information, as you can see, for comparators. And given that it's about water and 20-year averages are fairly important, we might see the columns such as that last column. This could also be classified according to water quality or geographic region. A statement of changes in water assets and water liabilities. We talk about water asset increases, the decreases, what's the net change. And you might notice a, uh, an item here, unaccounted for difference. That's basically recognising that after all things said and done and all of these have been measured or estimated using the best technology available, the amount of water that moves through an organisation will still probably not exactly match our, uh, our statements. And the aim is, of course, to reduce that on an annual basis. A statement of water assets and water liabilities for the same organisation might look something like, like this. So let me talk, uh, talk briefly now about the ARC project that, uh, that my colleagues and I are involved in. The first, as I mentioned, is, uh, is it's in three parts. Uh, the first part is the book that uh, 
that we're effectively launching this evening, uh, water accounting, international approaches to policy and decision making, which uh, emerged from a conference of world experts in relation to water and in relation to financial reporting and, uh, and water law, for instance, and also management. The book is comprised of three main parts. One investigates alternative systems. One looks at, one tests systems in practice. So for example, it does examine how well the general purpose water accounting system developed in Australia has been applied in South Africa and in Spain. In South Africa, it was applied in a particular, for a particular water authority that supplied water to quite diverse areas. And the purpose was to actually see whether the system could be used to separately identify the streams of water that were flowing through to different socio-economic groupings from the same river system within South Africa. And, uh, and it served that purpose very well. In Spain, we managed to convince uh, a water authority to, uh, to adopt the system. Uh, it worked too well. And when I say it worked too well, it's because, remember that unaccounted for difference that I mentioned? That was huge. What it revealed was that the authority was losing water that it had no idea it was losing. And so while they've retained it, hopefully for internal purposes, uh, politically it was not, uh, not ready to be, uh, to be reported. So that's, that's useful. The third part of the book, though, is the really interesting part. And that's the part that addresses international and national issues that water accounting can help to resolve. And how can it help to resolve these issues? Basically, because it reports what is in existence, what water or water rights exist, where are they held, what's happening with flows, what are the movements. And that helps to establish the property rights to that water. That's important for allocations. It's important when you're assessing contamination and supply issues for accountability. So when toxic waste is dumped into the Danube, general purpose water accounting, if applied on a national basis, should be able to trace that and help to establish some of the bases, the facts that can underpin the water law that follows. The book also addresses such matters as an intergenerational planetary trust. Uh, and in, for this chapter, we have, um, have professor, one of the uh, professors from Oxford whose area is environmental, uh, well, environmental sustainability, effectively, investigating the role that water accounting can play in protecting the environment for the future, for our future generations. The role of water in conflict mitigation. How establishing property rights is fundamental to actually, and, and doing this in relation to water, knowing what water we're debating, what we're fighting over, where it is, how it's been sourced, is absolutely critical to going to the next stage. Because if you can't agree what's at the fundamental core of the problem, then you can't really determine sensibly the solution. And similarly with dispute resolution. We also discuss in that, uh, in that, uh, that part, there's a chapter that addresses uh, how the mining industry in Australia is actually embracing the system. Why? Because there are huge political advantages to demonstrating their accountability and their management of water particularly given contamination and scarcity issues. Now the other two projects that are supported by the ARC uh, grant, or two sets of projects, involve experiments and, uh, and some thinking on our part, some additional thinking on our part. Uh, in brief, the experiments are three that, we've, uh, that we're funding. One, uh, which is being conducted by, uh, by researchers from 
uh, UNSW and from Monash, investigates the role of water accounting and assurance in influencing auditors' assessments, which there, thereby in turn affect investment decisions as a consequence of the audit function. But it's, very, it's really quite interesting to find that they find that uh, general purpose water accounting reports actually have a stronger impact on auditors' risk assessments than the financial reports that they use as, uh, as comparators. Another investigation is into the role of water accounting in influencing investors' decisions. Uh, that's uh, PhD being run through ANU. And uh, in this case, the students investigating whether the provision of water, water accounting information and particular types of water accounting information will actually affect investors' assessments of profitability for an organisation and therefore also of its share price increase or decrease, as the case may be. And the last experiment, uh, which is a PhD uh, from, uh, from Monash, which investigates the role of water accounting in a US context uh, to influence credit analysts' assessments, where the credit analysts are actually looking at, uh, uh, looking at decisions such as the credit worthiness of municipalities when they issue municipal bonds and of course have heavy infrastructure investment and the like. The last part of the, the, uh, the project which is probably going to be the most difficult and probably the most political relates to international water accounting standards. And this is a project that, uh, that Karen and I are involved with Given that water accounting seems to be able to provide some partial solutions in an Australian context, can it also serve a useful purpose internationally? We've seen that it can address at a theoretical level significant issues at an international level. This work has taken us uh, to talk to a huge range of, uh, a range of parties, including the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, uh, Nestle, the world's largest suppliers of bottled water, uh, the UN, uh, International Federation of Accountants, many international organisations. And it's fair to say that, that all of them are keen to see the, the, the progress of uh, an international arrangement. The question is, who? Who's going to set the standards? Who funds this? And who enforces any emanating standards? And that's going to be where we enter into some really interesting politics and, uh, and perhaps wish that we had flown under the radar. But, uh, but I think that this is going to be an incredibly important project going forward and it's certainly been seen as such uh, around the world. So moving on then to, uh, to a conclusion, it doesn't take much to work out that accounting is probably the ultimate policy tool. As I said before, that which is not measured is not managed. So financial accounting is a discipline grounded in economics and influencing economic outcomes. However, many of its impl implications cross uh, other disciplinary boundaries. Similarly, water accounting is even broader in many respects and deeper in terms of its implications. Now, someone put it recently, from health, hygiene and horticulture to wealth, well-being and viticulture, the fabric of the world's social, environmental and economic life depends on water. So not surprisingly, accounting for how, when and where water is used is absolutely critical to properly managing and governing what is indisputably the world's most precious resource. So to do that, we need plans. But those plans and actions need, and policies need to be underpinned 
by rigorous and practical systems and a language in common. And that's the direction we're heading in at long last. We've, been, we've seen the world's first in terms of a water accounting standard that has the potential to help transform water policy by reporting information for the first time and to assist the world's water industries as well by, by forcing a recognition of the need for better measurement systems and the like. But the reason that this system has reached as far as it has in a relatively short period of time is because of the conceptual rigour and also because of the stakeholder engagement. Now, I'd argue that, uh, that water accounting has grown out of a thirst for information that will underpin decisions. It will assist in many assessments. It will assist in policy development. It probably won't lead to world peace tomorrow or even the next day, but it is part of the solution, as I've indicated, in terms of such matters as dispute resolution and conflict mitigation that we otherwise have not been able to address because we haven't had the systems in place to do so in the past. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and uh, I'll pass across to Neil. Thank you. Before we open for a few questions, I'd like you to please join me in thanking Professor Jane Godfrey again. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like, on behalf of the college, I'd also like to thank Vice Chancellor Professor Ian Young and Professor Karen Chalmers for attending tonight. Um, before we get to questions, before I forget, outside you'll find a copy of the Quarterly magazine, which has a picture of green water. I'm not sure that that's a good thing, but we have a copy of water and an article about water and some of the other research that's happening in the college, which is always an interesting read. And it also has details in it on where you can obtain a copy of water accounting if you want that. I believe it's not available on iTunes yet, but all right. <laughs> okay. Amazon's right um, some questions. We have a short amount of time for a few uh, quick questions. Um, the order here is, in this theatre, if you could just please stand, state your name, your organisation, and ask your question clearly. Other people should be able to hear it. Academics are limited to questions that only have one part to the question. <laughs> okay. Kerry, start with Kerry Jacobs, and Jane, thank you very much. If uh, financial accounting is a basis of a market, capital market, is water accounting the basis of a water market? Uh, it's early days, but I would, uh, I would certainly expect that it will be part of that. Uh, as mentioned before, it's a way of actually using the same system for all parties to be able to record and, uh, and to have those, uh, the, the reports assured so that, uh, that when the market operates, it operates with credible information that's been developed systematically and consistently across, across Australia and the world. Uh, it's Bob Gregory hanging you. Um, I'm completely convinced of the need to record and have data. But I was just wondering, can I buy the book and cross out water and write down energy and do energy accounting? And then, or could I cross it out and write down health accounting? Or cross it out and write pollution accounting? Is there anything? intellectually special about water is distinct from people who do accounting for those other areas? Mm -hmm. um, well, apart from world peace, uh, world domination is, uh, is another, uh, another goal. Uh, Bob, that's a very good question. And, uh, and it's fair to say that, as I mentioned before, water accounting has actually evolved from financial accounting. And it commenced by, by exactly that same process do the cross-outs effectively. What is it about financial accounting that we can carry through to the water domain? So could this be taken across to energy? Could it be taken across to health? Absolutely. Uh, there would be various aspects that would need to be modified, but it is about uh, 
primarily reporting the information that users need. Uh, the language would obviously be, the nomenclature would obviously need to change to, uh, to various degrees, but there is scope for that type of work to, to occur, absolutely. Uh, it's not the way that, uh, that carbon accounting has been developed in, uh, in Australia or internationally because one of the things that's happened in relation to water accounting is that the origin is a conceptual framework from which everything else develops, whereas, uh, whereas that's not been an approach that's been taken in relation to some other forms of reporting. So does it have a generalizability? Yes, the theoretical framework is completely transportable, transferable. Mm -hmm. What are those areas in between? <laughs> okay, um, very good question. Probably, uh, probably the most controversial, and uh, is uh, is actually defining the water report entity, uh, which is the entity about which the water report is prepared. Why? Uh, because at the moment and certainly as was always envisaged by those who developed the conceptual framework, uh, it covers organisations, but it also covers physical entities. So in accounting, financial accounting, we talk about a reporting entity, and it's an organisation. It has to have deliberate financial transactions to A, exist, and B, have something to report. In the case of water accounting, and general purpose water accounting as I'm describing it, uh, you could have a river system with water running through it, clearly, and, uh, and various aspects that impact on human life, on the environment, and uh, on, on all sorts of aspects of life, from agriculture, as I said, to, to viticulture. The, the system then, is developed so that it can report for that entity. So this is about someone take, picking up an entity or taking a good look at that entity and reporting about its flows. It's not necessarily going to be that entity which prepares its own statements. So we have physical entities in this case which might not be deliberately managed. So it might be an unmanaged river system that's being reported on. Why? Because there's public interest in that river system. It might be a mining company, which also prepares financial reports. So that's probably been the most controversial of the, of the areas, uh, extending the scope beyond water authorities. And another one is, well, what about, what about the issues where you've got uh, one water report entity that might be part of a larger entity? to which the response is, well, you find that in financial reporting anyway because of the consolidation process, and that's perfectly acceptable that it will be part of another higher-order entity. Um, the biggest issue that, and we talked about this before, that when you're dealing with municipal governments, you're dealing with state, you're dealing with federal aspects to it, plus also cities in there as well, to reach agreement across all of those different levels of government, across the different financial standards that apply and water standards, those issues are going to be the biggest component. What are your suggestions then for who is going to be that body that sets those standards and who's going to be the implementation um, body to take them forward? You're talking in Australia? Well, the, I, I can only talk about the American example because that's where mm -hmm. we've been working lately, but I, let, let's talk about Australia. Yeah. Well, in, in Australia, the, the issues resolved uh, through, uh, through fiat, basically, uh, because the Bureau of Meteorology under the, under the National Water Act, uh, or the Water Act 2007, has, uh, has that responsibility and to, to develop water accounting standards. So it's actually the, the Bureau uh, that, uh, that we advise in relation to the issues. 
Um, and that's, but there's, a, there's an amazing uh, research paper coming out very, very shortly that investigates regulatory capture of the water accounting system. Uh, and Karen and I wouldn't happen to be co-authors on that, would we, Karen? Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, a very, it's a vexed issue because, uh, because you've got question marks as to who has the right expertise, who has the, the authority, but where are the conflicts of interest? in developing those standards, which are pretty much the same sorts of issues as you face in financial reporting, but perhaps, uh, but perhaps more subtle in some cases. Uh, I haven't answered the question for, uh, for, the, for the US, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future in Australia as well, because right at the moment, the only organisation that actually has an obligation to provide water accounting reports is the Bureau of Meteorology and it's actually responsible for setting the standards. Having said that, uh, I have to say that, uh, that it, is, it has allowed the board to operate extremely independently and not interfered with, with the decision making of the board. But I think that's the, that's, that's the important part. But once it's happened in Australia, Australia is acknowledged as being a world leader in relation to water, full stop, in terms of water management. And that's why we've had such a, a very positive reception when we've, uh, when we've been talking to parties, whether they've been in, in Washington DC or whether they've been Switzerland or wherever. Uh, there's been huge receptivity, South Africa or drier continents as well, of course, uh, huge receptivity to taking the Australian lead in this area. So, uh, so I think that bodes well, extremely well, because no one else has done it. Very much. Um, that's all the time we have this evening. Uh, this concludes tonight's official proceedings. I now invite you, however, to join us in the foyer for refreshments because in this room we have some economists, we have some philosophers, we have some Bureau of Meteorology, we have some accountants. So you don't often get together, so please feel free to talk to each other on the way out. Thank you very much. Thank you.